Hey, welcome to the Innovation Mindset, powered by the Jim Moran College of Entrepreneurship. I am your host, Mark McNeese, and in studio today, we have the founder and CEO of Canopy Road Cafe, Brad Buckingheimer. Hey, Brad, how are you doing? Thanks for coming in to the studio. What's up, my guy? Good to be here. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. Hey, happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. Are you open tomorrow? No, we are closed two days out of the year, Thanksgiving and Christmas. All right, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yep. Awesome. I really appreciate you coming in to the studio to tell your story. And before we get into Canopy Road Cafe, tell us a little bit about your FSU experience and what you're doing with FSU now. So I came to, I'm from Tampa, Florida originally, came to FSU in 99, and my freshman roommate is my business partner now. So we lived in Osceola Hall, which I, it's on Chapel, I don't know what it's called right now, but we, I was a fashion merchandising major, and Dean Fiorito was my teacher in college, so that's how we got oh, connected. Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. And she, I was looking for easy ways to get out of college. I was not, I, I did real well in school and, but I just wanted to get real world experience like as soon as I could. So we tailor made the program. I was a musician since I was 10 years old. And so I wanted to work in the entertainment industry. So she was real cool and figured out a way to have my internship still be a part of what I wanted to do. So I worked for a record label in Los Angeles, MCA records, and was out there for about two and a half years. And then David, my partner, who I mentioned, he was MCAT. He was exercise science. So there wasn't a medical school yet at FSU. And and then we worked at a place called Lunchbox, which is on Mayhem and Magnolia. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the only like local breakfast places in town, but we worked there in college. So he was studying for his MCAT and I have, was in the process of moving back from Los Angeles and the owners called David randomly out of the blue one day and said, hey, what would you guys think about buying the Lunchbox? He called me and he's, what do you think? And I said, well, I'm, I think it's a great idea. And so we took a chance and bought it. Turned out to be like awesome. It was just like working there, except you own it and you pay all the bills and stuff like that. That's from there. We came up with the Canopy Road brand and then we started in 2007, April 2007. And that's, so it's been 16 years now since we started the brand. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Coming from California myself, Manhattan Beach, California, people ask me all the time, what something, what do I miss about LA? And I would always tell them breakfast places. Yeah. And they're like, what do you mean breakfast places? I'm like, places that just do breakfast really well. Yeah. And really, a, a, you were guys like were the first in Tallahassee, at least in, on my radar, that were like super legit, like West Coast style breakfast place. And I remember it was by the old Albertsons. It's now it's like a bouncy place, right? Uh, it was a trampoline gym and they just went out of business. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, uh -huh. Okay. That's a tough place to town. Yeah. Part of town. I heard it was owned by an orthopedic surgeon. He was franchised by an orthopedic surgeon, which I thought makes, was pretty makes a lot of sense. Pretty clever move, I thought. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was a Larry's Giant sub. We called it the Bumblebee days because the inside was all black and yellow and we didn't have any money so we just had to leave it as it is and just put like pictures of breakfast stuff on the wall it was fun i definitely have a lot of good memories from the origination of it you know what i mean i loved it i loved the and in, in fact uh, just if you guys don't know i'm the founder of red eye coffee i don't own it anymore but one of the inspirations for the red eye capital circle stores patio was canopy road Really? cafe from your original one where you guys had that deck out yeah, there and I, I built that deck well, you built my, that yeah, me and, and my buddy i bought him a 12 pack of beer and we built it in a weekend i spent a lot of hours on that deck well, and you, and it, and it lives on 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 capital circle and uh, yeah that that was the inspiration i'm like hey you can put a deck in a parking lot That's and it's right. pretty cool we put a deck in a parking lot and that that was inspired by you and, i don't uh, know if you knew that i and i also don't know if people know probably wasn't super legal at the time i don't remember pulling any permits for it we just said ask the landlord hey can we build a deck under this tree which obviously the tree is an homage to the name too mm -hmm. which yeah i know you said you wanted to ask too. yeah tell, tell me about the name we he and i i, I tell people all the time because you had asked about fsu and i serve on the board now the entrepreneurship college because i feel i wanted to give back and you're here and it's been awesome getting to know you but dean fiorito was amazing and just really took care of my wife my wife's eight years younger than me and she taught her in college oh, wow. as well so we have some pretty deep connections with her but 
I tell people all the time when I'm in when I'm having to talk to students or anything else like that, and a lot of them get hung up on the name, and and it's very challenging too. Like the name, it's like what's challenging about it? I don't know. You you've got this idea in your head. You've got a product. You got a service or anything else like that, and. And a lot of times I tell people early on to, to, to really research IP. I think it's mm-hmm. something that doesn't really get taught a lot in school, but you might have the coolest name in the whole wide world. But if somebody has intellectual property rights on it, you need to go back to the drawing board or you're going to get probably get a cease and desist. So we had one good name, looked into it. Oh, somebody has it. Had another good name. Oh, man, it's available, but we can't go into Georgia because they have the rights on that. So we were tossing and turning, and Dave's mom was the one that came up with the name. She said, "There's you're from Tallahassee, and there's all these canopy roads around, and it's a it's a personification, not personification, but it's a it symbolizes the city, so to speak. And we didn't really have any other good options at the time. So we said, okay, we went for it. And people really liked it. And then when we grew outside of Tallahassee, my biggest fear was people were going to get asked about the name all the time. Nobody's going to know what a Canopy Road is. Everybody's going to be like, why in the heck is it named this? And <clears throat> I remember being from Tampa, we used to go tarpon fishing in Boca Grande all the time. And there were Canopy Roads down there too. Like the banyan trees would cover the road and stuff like that. My assistant a little while ago who went to FSU and she was a cheerleader, she I was trying to figure out words like when we do like to have a set that explanation of when when people ask us about it. And so he said it's just a natural phenomenon that occurs in the state of Florida and we're proud to be from Florida and that's what we would say from there on out. And then I had a, another mentor of mine a long time ago that was like when I, I was talking to him, I was like, yeah, what am I going to do when I go to Orlando or Tampa? And everybody's asking about the name. And he said, you know what, Brad? Like, do you think anybody really cares why Starbucks is called Starbucks? Do you think everybody really cares why Exxon's called Exxon? Do you really care? About- and at once once you get past a certain point, the name's just the name. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I try. I, I think I'm thinking back on it now. I don't know why I worried too much about it. You just got to pick something, make sure that you have the rights to it, and then just, just go ham and, so and, and trademark everything that you possibly can. That's for sure. Yeah, I use that example with the students at Jim Moran College all all the time because they spend so much time on the name and not enough time a lot of times on the business model. It's true. It's true. There's the other side of that. Exactly. And there's so many businesses that that we know and love that you really wouldn't make association. Google, Apple. What's Apple have to do with technology? That's That's a great example. And things like that. And there, and there's lots of companies that we could probably name that like Blockbuster mm-hmm. that had a great name, yep. but they didn't pivot and update their business model. We had we have a salad, salad and bowl restaurant that's newly open. Some students might know of it called Lemon and Time, and it's on Thomasville Road right by Red Eye, ironically. And we had a name. It was called Greenhouse, house spelled German, H-A-U-S. And mm-hmm. I was, like, in love with the name. It was on all the branding. It was on our pitch deck. It was on our, our business plans to the banks and to, to investors and stuff. And then at the 11th hour, we found out we couldn't do it, and it was just – it was devastating. You can't, you put all that egg, all those eggs in that basket, and then all of a sudden you realize you can't do it. And it took us a while to get back on track, and we – I got a lot of help through the Jim Rand School. I would ask people that I would run into and just get opinions from everybody. And it's really one of those one of those times where there's they have whiteboards and they call them whiteboards for a reason. And so you just set it up at the corner of your office and you just jot things down. Right. Any time, like very much like stream of consciousness, I've found is the best way that I do things. Like I would, I'll be thinking about something and I'll forget about things quick. So the best thing to do is just write it down, leave the room, spend a couple of times. You come back and you're like, yeah, oh, that's that's a good one. And so. There was a, our signature salad dressing is a lemon vinaigrette. And, mm-hmm. and and we started looking at the ingredients and things. And then we knew we wanted to take a more feminine twist on it because our founder is a, a 24-year-old woman who's, she's killing it, Kate Murray. Shout out to her. And, and it, and we knew that we wanted to have a little bit more softer feel to the brand and stuff like that. We started to think we wanted the word and have it be a symbol in the mm-hmm. middle. So you pick out things that, that you see or you're inspired by. And so we were able to come up with that and it's been a big hit. Everybody loves it. So. Uh, that, that's great. Yeah. I tongue in cheek tell, tell my students a lot of times, I'm like, don't name your baby until it's born. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's just because once you name it, you own it like in your heart <laughs> yeah. and soul and it's, most wow. ideas never come to fruition. And they're like, oh, man, it was such a great name. Yeah, you know? and I also, I'm also very wary. I tell people, like, be careful about naming the business after yourself, which which I found. You don't want to be part of the things that I found being an entrepreneur is that it's very challenging not to be 
personified by your business. So I'm known as Brad, the Canopy Road guy, like mm-hmm. whether I like it or not. Right. But if it was called Brad's, that's a little bit heavy handed. Yeah. If you have a bad experience for whatever reason yeah. or something happens, I'm going to be forever attached to it. You know what I mean? Which reminds me, this segment is brought to us by uh, Morgan and Morgan for the people. <laughs> <laughs> just no, just kidding. Where, we we don't have any sponsors. Where, there's times where it does work. Don't get me <laughs> wrong. So, <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the, in, you told us a little bit about the inception. Go a little bit more in depth, especially a lot of times students wonder about how do you go from having an idea and, and how did you fund this thing? Was it what I call the Try FAs of three Fs, the friends, families, and fools, or (laughs) how did you guys get going? Originally, I was dating a girl my senior year of high school, and it was very much like a teen rom-com. We were destined to be together, all that stuff, as we all find out is silly at the time, but we were dead set on going to UGA. I loved Athens. I was like in love with it. Great music scene. Got accepted there. Got into not to be braggadocious, but I got into all the schools I applied for. So I spent a lot of time like researching where I was going to go. And I was dead set about going out out of state. And then my parents saw what the bill was going to be. And they're like, hey, buddy, don't you maybe want to go to like UF or FSU? And then you can go to school for free. And we have this little nest egg that was your college fund. And so I was fortunate enough to barely keep my grades up enough to keep it the whole time. And so when I, and I had been in out in Los Angeles, I had my day job. And then at night, I would work at this high-end Mexican restaurant. I was bartending when I came back to Tampa. I've always been hospitality, like, forever. <clears throat> so when I came up to them and I was just like, hey, guys, what would you say if I took that money that I had saved up and I started a restaurant with it? And I thought for sure that they were going to eat my lunch. And they were both like, that sounds like a really good idea. That's definitely oh, that's cool. I had been entrepreneurial, like, growing up. I did little, like, side gigs and stuff like that. I think you can pinpoint when somebody's going to be an entrepreneur early on in their lifespan. Yeah, absolutely. Just by their personalities and stuff that they like to do. <clears throat> so I funded it with $50,000 that I had saved up that was supposed to go to me going to college. It was a turnkey restaurant, but it didn't have a hood. And for those who don't know, there's a ventilation hood if you um, fry anything or if you cook on a grill. So there was, it, and at the time it was 2006, 2007 when things were a lot cheaper. So you were able to do it for 50000 Now you can, that's like, you, you can't even get a meeting these days for, with a contractor for 50000 But right. But yeah, it was self-funded through that. And I, we, over the course of time, we just paid for everything out of cash flow. We just ended up, early on, David and I, again, we were, we've been best friends since we were 18 here at FSU. <clears throat> and we, he did well enough early on before I came on board because D- Dave bought Jenny's and then I came on afterwards, but he had bought a house and he's like, you can just stay with me. We'll just bunk it up. So it was like being back in college again, which is a little surreal as like 23, 24 year old guys. Like yeah. we had ne- never left, but we were very frugal. <clears throat> Didn't spend any, we, on our year anniversary, we took a trip to Vegas and just to treat ourselves. And we went to the blackjack tables and got on a little bit of a run. And then we just started losing really bad. And then we realized, let's just go out to eat and go to shows. And I just, we worked too, way too hard for this. Right. But uh, I, yeah, I'm the same way. I, <laughs> work it, too hard for this. I, I go to, <laughs> like, it's fun when you're winning, but I'm like, I lose five, 10 bucks. Oh, I'm like, all God. right, I'm good. I remember seeing these, like, these guys, they were sitting at, like, the $25,000 oh, buying tables. It's crazy. Was just, like, nuts. But, yeah, we were just very frugal, and we just put everything back into the business. And still, 12 stores deep, like, we still continue to do. We push the payday down the line. We obviously have great lives, and we take care of our families, and we're, we've done a great job. I'm very, I never thought in a million years that we'd be doing as well as we are, but I always just continue to reinvest in the business because I have a – an end game, you probably do a private equity play. We started mm-hmm. having some meetings with investment brokers and people that we've been really getting analytical with our data. We've hit a growth, like we just, like I said, opened our 12th store and we're taking all of 24 to really get down, get a really good solid pitch deck and start shopping in private equity. We've had a lot of interest. And truthfully, we've got, we've hit all of our benchmarks, all of our KPIs, and we're at like double digit EBITDA and double digit year over year growth and and anybody that's looking eventually if you guys have a business or you're starting a bit or you're looking to not divest but you're just looking for capital raise stuff like that there's some studying your kpis on your specific industries and stuff and what's important for investors to look for and stuff like that you have to know you your, measure you what gotta, matters you gotta know your shit before you go into this thing man you exactly know, because you can't show up to the party looking like a dummy and you might know your business inside and out but it has to make sense on paper and 100%. Even now, as a 40-year-old man, I'm still learning more and more. My 
as time's gone on, used to be I would cook the line all the time. Then eventually I had teams of managers to do that. And then I'd be like, what do I do now? So I guess I'll just roll this cash flow over and get a new store. And then it just took on a lifespan of itself. We never went out and did any sort of capital raises. We bootstrapped everything and then eventually got into banking, learning what banks like to look at when they're Mm -hmm. looking at investing and stuff like that. So each phase has taught me a lot. The bigger that we get, the more money requirements that there are. Each phase has been new and it's fun. It's fun to learn different things and to evolve and grow as an entrepreneur, which you and I both know never stops. You know what I mean? It Um, never stops. But there are times where I'm just like, I'm just like, what am I doing? You know what I mean? Especially when it comes to capital raising, it's very challenging. It is. It is definitely challenging. So let me roll back to Opening up your first store there on Monroe, Monroe, on Monroe in 2007. And take us through from there to now having uh, your 12 stores and really your thought process from going from one to two and then two to three. And then I especially would love to hear what was going on in your mind and what were this discussions happening when you thought you had a brand that you could take into another market? Yeah, great questions. So one, we outgrew the first store. It was small. I always recommend now, if you have an idea, to try and do it in the smallest footprint possible. I think COVID taught people a lot of lessons where they probably had too much real estate that they needed than they actually needed and stuff like that. So our process was always like, pack those pack a small but comfortable room out and make it seem like you're packed to the gills all the time and that will increase word of mouth and stuff like that so there was just capped it was just like the lunchbox it's you're capped at a certain amount of you're capped at x amount of volume no matter how much you push it and how busy you can be every single day you're never going to get above this Mm -hmm. based on number of seats so we said okay let's try not necessarily doubling the seats but let's increase the kitchen size and let's increase the dining room and let's do another one And one to two was the worst out of my whole entire career. And I've talked to other people too. When they've grown from one unit to two, it's the most challenging in the whole, in the whole process easily, because not only replications, you're still not set in your systems. And then what the X factor that people don't think about is now there's a comparable. Now you can say, I went to this one and the eggs were great. And I went to this one and they overcooked the eggs. And that was not something that I did. I took, I was probably a little sensitive at the time because I was, you're on your high horse and you're like, you're doing so well. You have a second location and you, like I said, systems are very important and consistency is always going to be the biggest challenge to us. But yeah, one thing that when <clears throat> Red Eye went from one to two and I thought I was the smartest smartest restaurateur in the world yeah, with one does, yeah. and I'm like oh <laughs> man we got this great brand and we're gonna open up this second one and what I realized was all those little cracks that you could just manage became gaping holes and and I tell my students all the time or entrepreneurs that I'm working with I'm like so you want to scale? No. It's boring. It's not fun. You think, surely it's common sense. They'll do this. They're not going to do it. Yeah. And <laughs> and what's funny about our brand is that a lot of times we found ourselves working in reverse. By the time we, we got over the humps of the second one, and I was also a pretty bad micromanager, so I always recommend people Given letting people have response, letting your management teams and other people have responsibility and make mistakes and then correct the mistakes instead of trying to work over top of them and prevent the mistakes from actually happening. Because if you have good credibility and you're and people know how hard you work and how hard you try, they're going to be a little bit more forgiving. And so that was a tough lesson going from one to two. <clears throat> but then by two, we were like, okay, like there's enough demand. Like I've heard of people outside of Tallahassee that when they come for a football game, that's their place to go. We started having, which is, I guess, before like Google Analytics, you would have word of mouth and people kept saying, oh, I wish that we had one of these in Orlando or I wish we had one of these and so on and so forth. And by that and by that time, we were like, let's just build one from the ground up. The first two had been had been turnkey former restaurants. And so let's just try to build one from the sticks and the bricks. So we went out and we we started getting into looking at demographics and looking into traffic patterns and car counts and started working a lot with commercial real estate agents and learning about that side of the business. That's something that's the side of the business that I love. I love commercial real estate. 
probably when I die and come back, I'll be a commercial real estate agent. Uh, there's something fascinating about it to me. I, I can't explain it. <laughs> but that, so our third location was on Appalachian Parkway down the street from the campus by downtown. And it checked a lot of boxes. It was on the four, a quadrant of four different demographics that we thought we served well. It was our first foray into being like a really like part of a tenant lineup, which now is a critical piece when we're looking to go into business. We, we had a lot of a big anchors there. Dick's Sporting Goods is an anchor there. Party City is an anchor there. There's a BJ's Brew House, which sits on the out parcel. All those guys drive vehicle, vehicle drivers to the plaza. That was when we started learning about it's good for us to be an end cap so we can have a patio. So that was like our biggest lesson and foray into what it's going to be like moving forward. And that store to this day is still the highest volume out of the whole entire state of Florida. Like it's just, it's one of those needle in the haystack spots. Like we really landed like a good spot. The landlord's awesome. He loves us. Um, and then now we've built one from the ground up and we paid it all out of cash flow. And we paid it off. It was, I think it was like $150,000, $180,000. And we paid it off in 18 months, nice. like straight out of cash flow. And we were, we, we had since we don't live together anymore. We both had places to live. And so we were, we we're like, okay, I think we got something now. You know what I mean? And then when we decided, we opened up a fourth one in Southwood. <clears throat> and then we were like, I had always had the mindset that I didn't want to be a big fish in a small pond. I wanted to, I thought that we had enough differentiators in our business and in the breakfast market, primarily around menu items. And then also just our service was just unmatched. Like people, we very strict in hiring process. Like it, you have to be a certain kind of personality to work with us. And People were just like freaking out. They loved it. And so we, I had an assistant, like a guy that was in a, a fraternity and he was always buddying up with me. He would always ask questions. He, I was, I was happy to, I love being a mentor. It's fun. I'm sure you agree. It's a, it's very, it's a very good feeling when you can give back and show people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how to not make the same mistakes as you, yeah, but he, I, would, he would always want to sit in on meetings and stuff. So it, it was good. And uh, he, he would come around and he would be like, dude, I think, I think I might want to do my own one of these. Could you, what do you think about that? And I was like, it would probably be more of like a franchise deal. And his older brother went to Rosen Hospitality School in UCF. <clears throat> I was like, I was like, we can maybe figure something out. So I had to file FDD. I had to do, take all the steps that you have to take when you want to franchise your business. It's a whole other ball yeah. of wax, believe me. But we, he wanted to go to Windermere in Orlando where they're from. They have family that works for Disney and stuff like that. I was like, I don't know, man, that's a big, big market. I'm a little worried about that. But I had some connections in Jacksonville. So I was like, what do you think about going to Jackson? He was just so eager. He's just, I love it. Jack sounds great. So we had studied a lot of where kids were going when they graduate from FSU mm -hmm. because we felt like we were familiarizing the, we were familiarizing with them with the brand here. And then when they go and get jobs elsewhere, we want to be there to grow with them there. And so Jacksonville was a good good decision for us, I felt. And so Jacksonville was the first new market that, that you went into out of Tallahassee. That's correct. All right. And just real quick, before we go to Jacksonville, <laughs> and I serve in Jacksonville all the time, and you'll have to tell me where the Canopy Road uh, is in Jacksonville. Well, where is it? Yeah. It's uh, one's on Phillips Highway in like Bayard mm -hmm. off old St. Augustine Road. And then the second one is in St. John's, okay. so South Jacksonville off County Road 210. And then they're building a third one in Mandarin. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. But they all live in Jack's Beach and yeah. surf all the time. That's cool. <laughs> um, so I want to ask this question because I think it's important, especially for a lot of new entrepreneurs, because, just because I know a little bit about your store. Your first store is no longer existing. Your second store is no longer existing. The first store still exists. It's the same one. Monroe is, that, is the same. Is Monroe still there? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, we tried to make a play to buy the building, but... Uh, I didn't but, know that. So the original is still there. Oh, yeah. Is the deck still there? Yeah. All right. Still... All still right. I, I apologize. I didn't even good. know. I didn't know it was there. I, I don't get over that area very often. And so. then the second store, we just... Our lease ran out. And right. We, because a church had bought the, the plaza, which was an odd thing, a church buying a retail plaza and becoming the anchor. And I, I, bring, I bring it up because um, sometimes strategically you make moves... You or leases, you know, even leases, maybe are, they, they want way too much money or stuff like that. So before we go on, where, where are the locations in Tallahassee now? And so is the one at Four Oaks Plaza the only one that 
Yeah, so we, Sunset. so we we relocated that store to Capital Circle across the street from Lowe's and Publix, mm-hmm. <clears throat> which is, and it ended up being the, the ingress egress there is a little wonky, but that one is packed. It's all packed. It's the packed. Time. And truthfully, it's again, it's one of those things. It's hard to see it on a map. The hospitals drive traffic there big time. Okay, two major hospitals in that area. There's a lot of offices around there. That's definitely the two dudes. Gonna, like you and I would go there and grab breakfast. Like mm-hmm. that's the store more than likely because it's in a strategic place by everybody's office. Yeah. Also, there's something really nice about it because it has like it's all it's almost like the Red Eye Midtown location it has those big windows and it's yep. really open and everything. Okay, you got the one on Monroe. You got the one on Capital Circle. Where else? The, oh, the Southwood. Park, Southwood, yeah. Parkway store. And then we just opened a fifth one out northeast Tallahassee, mm-hmm. which is where I live. Where it used to be the bagel place. That's right. That's by, for those of you. It used to, yeah, yeah. It used to be the bagel place with the big yellow umbrellas. And how long have you guys been there? So we just opened three months ago. Okay. Yeah, so th- we've recently just opened four Three stores in four months, which I don't oh. recommend that happening. But <laughs> I'm glad that you guys finally came back to the Northeast because I live in the Northeast. Yeah, it's nice to be there. We've it, now that we have some cash and we're able to build one from the ground up on our seed. We were getting into a situation where all these new stores that we were building they kept getting nicer and yeah. the aesthetics. David's wife Morgan, who went to school here, she went to interior design school here. She has her own firm. And she started, she was doing residential, but she got bored with it. And mm-hmm. so she, we brought her on to start doing some commercial design work for our restaurants. And nice. once we brought her on, man, it was a game changer. Like pe- the way people reacted with these new build outs and stuff, it was just like, they were freaking out because yeah. they are really nice. So I need to go to that. The location of, of that new store in Tallahassee, just that big open patio area, and it's protected from Thomasville Road, so yeah. you're not really getting all of that. That that's a great location. It's on the correct side of the road. Yeah, it's people, on the yep. people that are which you just you have to pay so much attention to that, as we were talking about yeah, earlier. Yeah, like, earlier. One biggest mistake of my life was not understanding ingress egress. That's two words I live by, and a lot of times people, a lot of times people know what it means now, but. If you make it that much challenging to get to your place, they'll just skip you and go eat somewhere else. It's sad but true. Yeah, no, it, it's hard. It, our old place in Bannerman Crossings to get off uh, to get in there, you had to make you had to go through two roundabouts and make one right, two rights, three rights, and a left. Four turns. I'm, I'm worn out just four, just four, listening four to turns. <laughs> I would time it, and it would from Bannerman. It would take you literally. 35 seconds to get off Bannerman and to my front door. And I would try to explain that to people and they're like, no, no, no it's not the time. It's it's two roundabouts and everything. And, and it's crazy when you yeah, think about it. Really ingress crazy. egress is just, it, and this was one of my like, oh, I got this great brand and everything. Not great enough for people to make four turns. And it's, and that's <laughs> the saddest part is that time is money, right? And if it takes yeah. somebody X amount of time longer to get to somebody or you don't have a drive through, which has been a big right. thing. We, we almost took the boosters were talking to us about potentially taking what is now that Bowden's place. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we had heard that Starbucks was there originally. <clears throat> and, and I guess the new CEO that took over after Schultz came a second time and right. then left again, said that it, if there's not a drive through on it, kill the deal, like, immediately yeah. on the spot. So they that Starbucks was supposed to go in. They wanted a coffee user there. Starbucks backed out, like, really right before they, they like, they're about to sign, like, wet ink. So yeah. they asked us to do it. There's all these little things that you just, you know, you learn over time, man, and drive throughs weren't as much of a thing. You know, Starbucks had a lot of footprints that didn't have drive throughs right. and it was fine. There were community-based stores and things like that. Yeah, their, their business model has radically changed from the, the early days. Absolutely, yeah. And at one point they were going to do, remember, they were going to do happy hours and they were mm-hmm. gonna the, the third, fifth place or whatever they were calling yeah. it. You know what yeah. I mean? But yeah. yeah, we've been real happy out there. It's been ever since we looked at it before the pandemic and we were a little concerned because we were What's that Monday through Thursday traffic going to be like? Of course, you're going to get killed in the suburban market on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mm -hmm. But then we saw a huge shift. I talked to a lot of colleagues out there, and I was like, what are your lunches like now? And and they were like, dude, ever since the pandemic, like – everybody works from home and so there there was a shift in everybody's it's not nine to five anymore you know what i mean sometimes people are waking up at eight and they're knocking off early sometimes people are sleeping in and knocking out a bunch of work from say 11 to 
four and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we've seen a big change in like demographic behavior, like as far as when people are, when the streets used to be busy versus when they are now, things like that. So we felt a little bit more comfortable getting into it now post pandemic with some of those shifts and it's proved to be good so far. So I don't want to jinx it or anything. Oh yeah. (laughs) Tallahassee five, five, five stores, Jacksonville, Two, a third, Two on a third on the way. And then what other markets are you in? So then there's, so we got into Tampa just because I suppose a little bit was vanity trying to come back home and mm-hmm. set up shop and be like, look what I've done. But we just knew that Tampa was on a come up. Obviously it's been growing and accelerating in population for a long time, but we knew the area that I grew up in, South Tampa, it's, that's not really a, it wasn't a smart play. We knew that we needed to be in areas where there was going to be growth and where it wasn't completely oversaturated. So we looked at like tertiary markets outside of the core Tampa area and we settled on East Tampa. So like Brandon, we have a store in Brandon right off of I-75 by like Top Golf in the mall. And then we have a store in Fishhawk Ranch, which is a little bit Southeastern of there where my part, my operating partner down has a a, he lives down there and then we just opened last week a new store in riverview florida which in the 80s and 90s was not really anything and now all of a sudden just because there's nowhere else to go there's a high demand for just anything really so in tampa in particular you have to go where there's you have to really pay a lot of attention what's where people need stuff because otherwise they're just gonna they're gonna make you put a song and dance on and be like what have you done for me lately you know what i mean and then so there's three there And then we got into the beach markets, we call them, which is 30A area, so west oh, okay. west of Panama City Beach. And during the pandemic, it's a, it's a, obviously a very well-known area now. Mm-hmm. It's very up and coming. A lot of people from Tallahassee all vacation over there. It's a market where it's I'm astounded at the growth. I, I, it's got to be one of the most up and coming areas in the whole state of Florida. And a lot of that was generated because during the pandemic, you had a lot of people traveling down to Florida, especially people from up north and people that had heavy restrictions and stuff like that. But when we got over there, it was during the pandemic and we were being, we were were just being aggressive. It was at a time where the national media and stuff were, I I say this, I don't know if it's necessarily like true or this is my opinion. I felt like the media was blaming bars and restaurants for the spread of COVID. Like it was all our fault. And so I think... We, I knew that we were going to bounce back. I just knew it in my gut. I'm a hospitality guy at heart. And we decided to be really aggressive because there's probably some people that have either gone out of business or there's people that landlords are probably, this is the only time you're going to see them exposed a little bit and be able to get a good deal. And I'm still to this day shocked. Number one, that we even got the space where we are, but number two, that we got it at the price that we got it at. So it was, we were aggressive and it paid off. So we have a store in Rosemary Beach and then I'd say four months ago, five months ago, we opened a store in Seagrove Beach, which is actually on 30A, the road that runs from 98 across the water okay. and connects back up. It's fun. It's a tourist market, but there's a lot of locals there, which is really cool because the locals all come. They live there part time. A lot of them are from places like Nashville. Yeah, Nashville and Texas. Kentucky and Texas. <laughs> and so if you're going to... The goal there is to be like the favorite place when you're visiting because then they're going to go back home and they're going to be like, man, I really wish I had a camp road in Birmingham, Alabama or Atlanta, Georgia and stuff like that. So we knew that we would come in there and make an impact immediately. We knew the players in the market and we felt like we can compete with them. And then we'd also made a lot of friends and we knew that we could offer people better opportunities and stuff like that. So our team over there is phenomenal and have worked for a lot of like really good places over there. And I'm just so thankful that we have them because they do a great job. Well, that, well, congratulations on you so all much. your success. I appreciate and it. so I like to ask always entrepreneurs that come in, especially successful ones like you, yourself, tell, if you're comfortable, tell us about a hard time or a time you just wanted to quit or just what am I doing? If you feel comfortable, pull back the curtain a little bit and, and tell us about a hard time. Right now, to be perfectly honest, this has been, we've never done three stores in a year before. And, and since we have bootstrapped the whole thing on our own, like we, we're, we've taken a significant capital risk and we feel good about our decisions and we're not in any jeopardy by any means. When you, 
put a lot of money on the table and you put a lot of faith in people and that locations are going to work out, it's going to keep you up at night. The first time that uh, first time I had to close a place or I mean other ventures that I've been involved in, it'll keep you up, man. It's not fun. And uh, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of self doubt that happens after that, and you. Uh, And you try to retrace your steps. Again, like you and I were talking about earlier, like it's the biggest lessons that I've had have been failures. And while they're not fun or easy to deal with, it's, it, you just, the only times you really keep yourself up at night is trying to, they say what, insanity is like doing the same thing over and over again. Expected. Yeah, expected a different result. That's right. But you just, you're just like, gosh, I hope I'm not like doing the same, making the same mistake again. So you just have to have enough confidence in yourself. The first time you close anything or like when that second store, when we just couldn't figure out a way to make it work and we had to kind of eat it a little bit and use some money to relocate, which ended up being a great decision. But there's just, there's so many times that you have those moments where you feel like you failed or you feel like you made a mistake. And unfortunately with entrepreneurship, like I said, it's all personified. It's your business. Right. And so you you just don't want to, you can't let it affect your decision making. And I ask a lot of questions now, that's for sure. I definitely went through a part earlier in my career where I got a little starry eyed and you and I talked about that too. Where you're proud of yourself and you kind of, you can't rest on your laurels and think that just because you've had a little bit of success, that means anything. You have to constantly ask questions, constantly get advice from trusted sources and stuff like that. And it helps make those moments not happen quite so often. That's for sure. So I always like to conclude, you're 40 years old now-ish. Yeah, right? ish. <laughs> and so if you could go back to your, you as 20 years old before you really embarked on all this journey and you could tell yourself one thing, what would you tell 20-year-old Brad? I'd be like, man, that's a nice body you have now because I wish I had that still. I would say... It's going to get it's going to get rough at times but you don't ever get up don't ever give up you uh, and don't be afraid to make that decision because a lot of times people get hung up on whether they should or should not do it and it's, it, it's I, I hate to be cliche with the Yoda term but it really is like either do it or don't do it don't there's no, no in between yeah there's just no in between do or don't do yeah, all right no it's a wrong between. accent but yeah, <laughs> I know, it was, you're close okay. <laughs> but but yeah just trust yourself trust your gut that's a, that's probably what I would definitely lead with because there's gonna be a lot of outside chatter about everything and the goal is just to really be confident enough in your abilities and yourself and you'll make the right decision in the end Thank you so much for coming in. Hey, let's have breakfast in the Northeast. I I know a new place that we can check out. Love to have you. We'll we'll leave the light on for you, buddy. That (laughs) sounds good. Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Innovation Mindset. Um, Thank you again, Brad, from Canopy Road Cafe for coming in and sharing your journey with us. Hey, do us a favor. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, drop us and give us a a comment. And also please share, share with entrepreneurs that need encouragement and want to learn from other successful entrepreneurs. Thanks a lot. Hopefully you have a great day. Killed it.